So good to be in God's house on a Wednesday night, isn't it? Amen. Amen. Glad that you're here. If you could turn to Galatians 6 and 7. One verse of scripture and then we're going to get started tonight. And if I, if I like, um, you know, do some really awkward like hand motions tonight, you'll understand why. Usually I only have one free hand when I talk to you, so this is, this is unique. I'm drawing a lot of attention to this lapel mic. That's totally, totally wrong of me to do. That's probably the first thing I'd tell you not to do in public speaking, but whatever. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Can we read it together? Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Now, if we could do it just in Mackenzie style and read it backwards. Reap also he shall that, soweth man a whatsoever for, mocked not as God, deceived not be. It sounds like Yoda. I wonder if we, one more time, could just ask God to bless the preaching of the Word. And let's ask that all flesh would get out of the way and just that His Spirit would speak. It's not about what I have to say, but what, what the Holy Ghost has to say tonight. Can we pray one more time? Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your word. God, we're so excited that we get to dive into it tonight. And I pray that it would be quick and powerful, alive, and it would touch our hearts and speak to our hearts, God. And Jesus, we come against everything that the enemy would long to do uh, in these young people's lives. And we just pray that your spirit would be exalted and lifted up in us. Let us leave this place changed in Jesus' name. Somebody said amen. Amen. You can be seated. It's good to have Aaron Peter Paul with us tonight. <laughs> if he smells funny, uh, it's not his fault. He's been working with the fishes. Right? Did I get that right? Lobster. Okay, even better. I'm just messing. It's good to have you home. Um, did anybody, when you were a kid, did you ever have those books? They're called Choose Your Own Adventure Books. Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, how many had one of those? Mike, you got a few over here. For those of you that don't know what they are, I, I didn't really, I guess I, know, I knew what they are, what they were. Um, I never ever owned one. I think I remember having friends, seeing them read them in, in school and whatever. But basically, you start the book the same as everybody else, but then you, uh, you're able to, at a certain point in the book, the, the author will say, if you'd like the main character to do this, go to page whatever. And if you'd like him to do alternately this, you go to this page. And, and basically, you made your own uh, story based on your decisions. It, it was kind of a neat idea. And a book this long could really be about this long because, you know, you, there was so much extra material in there. And you could read through the book a second time and get a different outcome. Again, totally based on your decisions. Kind of unique. They have something very similar on YouTube now. They're called interactive videos. Maybe you've seen them. You start with the first video, and then at the end of that video, there's like a decision. And you can choose, uh, you know, make this character do this or that. And you choose whichever one you want. You click on a link, and it will take you to the corresponding video. And you can see this, this funny character or whatever do all kinds of unique things based, again, completely on your decisions. It's kind of neat. You know, choices are powerful. I think it goes without saying, but the choices that you and I make on a day-to-day -day basis are very, very powerful. It goes beyond just a choose-your-own-adventure book or an interactive video on YouTube. Your choices, really, they form your whole life. Just like those books and YouTube videos, the outcome of your life is based upon the decisions that you make. A guy by the name of Albert Camus, if I'm saying that right, he said it this way, Life is the sum of all your choices. Life is the sum of all your choices. And tonight, I want to speak to you on this subject. It's kind of a, it's a subject I've never really tackled or talked about before, but it's decisions you didn't know you were making. Decisions you didn't know you were making. Um, there was a guy once, you probably know him or maybe have studied him in school, his name is Isaac Newton, and he was kind of big on physics, and he wrote all these laws of motion. And Newton's third law of motion, anybody know it? You physics uh, students? That's right, yeah. For every action, can you finish it? There is an equal and opposite reaction. Let's say it again. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. 
Now, Sir Isaac Newton, he was talking about physics. You know, if you kick a dog in the face, the dog is going to fly across the yard, right? Because for every... A that was a joke. You guys can laugh. It's okay. I don't kick my dog very often. It's, o it's okay. But, okay, if you kick a soccer ball, that's an action. But the equal and opposite reaction is it's going to fly across the yard and hit your dog in the face, right? Okay, you guys just... Tough crowd, tough crowd. He was talking about physics, but this principle, it can be observed in many other areas of life as well. You can observe it in your conversations, the words that you speak alone and with other people. You can observe it in your actions. You can observe it in how you spend your time and so on. Really, uh, this principle, it applies to every single decision that you make in life. The words you decide to speak, the actions you decide to do and and act. The time management, the, the time, how you decide to spend it, it's all, all of your decisions are affected by this principle. I could say it this way, okay? For every decision, there is an equal and potentially opposite decision. I could also say it this way. Every uh, time you make a decision, there are other decisions being made that you might not even know about. Decisions you had no idea you were making. I could say it even more simple than that. Every time that you say yes or no to something, you are simultaneously saying yes or no to something else. When you say yes to the extra piece of chocolate cake with extra fudge icing on the top every single day, when you say yes to that, you're also saying yes to high blood sugar and no to being skinny. You know, there's equal and potentially opposite reactions to every action, to every decision. When you say yes to watching five straight episodes on Netflix until three in the morning, you are saying no to being well rested and no to getting a good head start the next morning. You might even be saying no to the job that you're going in for an interview for. You know what I'm saying? For every decision, there is an equal and potentially opposite decision being made. When you say yes to owning a wild raccoon, you are also saying yes to rabies. It just, that's how it works. Okay? When you, say, uh, when you say yes to excessive video games, you're also saying no to uh, study time for the test that you have the next day. And, and by saying no to study time, you're saying yes to failing the test. And by saying yes to failing the test, you're saying no to passing the class. And you're saying yes to going to summer school. And you're saying no to the summer job that you could have had. And you're saying no to the paycheck that you could have been getting every two weeks. And, and therefore, you say no to your savings account for post-secondary education, and you're saying no to post-secondary education, and you're saying yes to being a gravedigger for the rest of your life, making $3.75 an hour, and you will never, ever own that convertible. You understand that just because you said yes to too many video games, you are saying no to that convertible. How many want a convertible? Yeah, you can only drive it for like three months of the year around here, so... Well, you can drive it all year round, but it's just not as fun in the winter. But you understand, every decision you make, there is a correlating decision in the background that maybe you don't even realize that you're making. No decision that you make in life is ever made in a vacuum. Do you understand what I mean when I say that? Meaning it doesn't impact something else. You can't make a decision over here and it not impact other areas of your life. It's impossible. No decision is made in a vacuum. Every decision you make impacts something else in your life. Somebody say amen. amen. You might think that what you're engaged in, that activity, that indulgence, that relationship, even that sin, you might think that it's an isolated thing that impacts nothing else in your life, but that is a farce. That's a lie. It does. Because every decision you make in the background, there are corollary, correlating decisions that are being made at the same time. Our world, they fail to realize this. And you see it all the time. You hear about it Monday morning at school when all the weekend party stories come uh, rushing in and people are talking about them. Our world, they live for the moment. Their mantra is, if it feels good, then go ahead and do it. But they fail to see that every time they make a decision, they're making other decisions at the same time. When people say yes to casual sex, they're saying no to marital intimacy with the future spouse, and yes, to heartache and turmoil and chaos inwardly 
and potentially even yes to unwanted pregnancies. You see, it's decisions they didn't know they were making. When people say yes to drugs and alcohol, they're saying no to good judgment and yes to addiction and chemical dependency. Decisions they didn't know they were making. Every decision a person makes comes along with other decisions. Ones that were unknown to you. Now, I could look at every single person in this room. I could look at myself. I could look at our pastors. I could look at this entire church, the individuals that make it up. I could look literally at every single human being on the face of planet Earth. And if I took a snapshot of what they are now, if you took a snapshot of my life and what it is right now, or if I took one of yours, I could trace it back for the good or for the bad to some decisions that you made. Thankfully, all of you, uh, it's awesome you guys are all in church tonight. You know why you're in church? It's because somewhere along the line, whether it was you that made the decision or a parent that made the decision or whatever, there were some decisions that were made and they thought they were just making an isolated decision. Maybe you thought you were making just an isolated decision back here, but what you didn't realize is that that decision back here made the decision for you to be in church here tonight. I can look at somebody that maybe is very well-to-do. They have a great family, a good job, a nice home. And we look at them and we think, wow, they got it all together. They got a great life. But you got to understand that there were some decisions that were made way back when in their life. They made a decision to apply themselves in high school. They made the decision to go to post-secondary ed education uh, institutions and get a degree perhaps. Or maybe they made the decision to just start low in a company and work really hard and build their way up and climb the ladder. And we look at where they are today and think, wow, that's great. But, but they made some decisions back here. And little did they know that by deciding to apply themselves here, they were making the decision to be successful up here. Decisions they didn't know they were making. Likewise, you can look at a homeless man on the street begging for money to buy drugs. And you can feel bad for him, and, and that's, that's okay to feel bad and feel compassion. But really, you can trace it all back to some bad decisions. Decisions to hang around the wrong people. A decision to try that hit of that drug. A decision maybe to leave home just a little bit prematurely and go out on his own or her own. And you see, they never made the decision to be on the side of the road begging for money to buy drugs, but really they did. Because way back here, they made some decisions, and along with it, there were other decisions they had no idea they were making. It's not just in everyday life, people that you can observe, but it's in the Scriptures too. You don't have to look very far to look at somebody that made some decisions they didn't know they were making. You start with the first human beings on planet Earth, Adam and Eve. They thought they were only deciding to take one small bite of a forbidden fruit. That's all they thought. That was the decision, right? To eat or not to eat. That is the decision. Now they made a decision. Take a bite. Eve passed it to Adam. He take a bite. But really, along with that decision... They were deciding that every human being after them would be born with a sinful nature. A decision they had no idea they were making. But you see, no decision is made in a vacuum. Every decision made, it impacts other things. And there's under-the-surface decisions being made. Lot, you can remember him. He was the one that wanted to uh, move to the, to the plains, the valley, where it was well watered, near the twin cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, he thought he was only you know, deciding to move. Like, that was a decision. Stay with Abraham or, 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 or go, uh, I, I guess, some other place in the cities, but go with Abraham or go to the Twin Cities. That was the decision, to move or not to move. But in the background, really, you know what else he was deciding? Among other things, that his wife would be ensnared by worldliness and ultimately destroyed. One decision greatly impacted his family. You see, decisions can never be made in a vacuum. They always impact other decisions. Decisions you didn't know you were making. In Numbers chapter 33, God speaks to the children of Israel through Moses. And you know who Moses is. But verse 50, let's read. The Lord spake unto Moses in the plains of Moab by Jordan near Jericho, and he said this, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When you're passed over Jordan into the land of Canaan. Now you guys know what Canaan is. It's the promised land. God is saying when you get into the promised land... Verse 52, then ye shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you and destroy all their pictures and destroy all their molten images and quite pluck them, 
pluck down all their high places. Basically, get rid of all their pagan gods. That's what God is saying. Verse 53, And ye shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land and dwell therein, for I have given you the land to possess it. Ye shall divide the land by lot for inheritance among your families. And to the more ye shall give the more inheritance. To the fewer ye shall give the less inheritance. Every man's inheritance shall be in the place where his lot falleth. According to the tribes of your fathers ye shall inherit. In verse 55, here's a warning. But if you will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come to pass that those which ye let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your sides and shall vex you in the land wherein ye dwell. Moreover, it shall come to pass that I shall do unto you, Israel, as I thought to do to them, your enemies. So basically, God gives a command, right? Drive out the inhabitants, destroy their pagan gods. Pretty plain, pretty simple. You understand? And it, it, it seems easy enough, but... Nonetheless, we read in Judges chapter 1, after Moses has gone and off the scene, Joshua is in charge now, and Judges 1.17 says this, Judah went, to Simeon, went with Simeon, his brother, and they slew the Canaanites, so, so far so good, that inhabited Zephath, and utterly destroyed it, and the name of the city was called Hormah. Also Judah took Gaza with the coast thereof, and Ascalon with the coast thereof, and Ekron with the coast thereof. And the Lord was with Judah, and he drove out the inhabitants, drove them out of the mountain, Look at this. But he could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley because they had chariots of iron. So basically, you know, they were doing good. They were driving them out. But then they, they came up against an opponent that was quite strong. Iron chariots. They just couldn't attack those because they were too weak. But if you fast forward just a little while, verse 28 says this. And it came to pass... When Israel was strong. See, now they have the, the manpower. Now they have the ability to take out these iron chariots. They can do this. But when Israel was strong with all the ability they needed, they put the Canaanites to tribute. You know what that means? They hired them. They used them as workers and they paid them a wage to till their fields and to man their farms. They hired them. And they did not utterly drive them out. They disobeyed God's command. They made a decision. They made a decision. Should we obey God and drive out our enemies? Or you know what? Should we just kind of take a breather and let these enemies of ours work our fields for us? That was the decision. And they made it. You read on Judges chapter 2. And an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, I made you to go up out of Egypt and have brought you unto the land which I swear unto your fathers. that You're here. The promised land. You're here. You got it. You got what I promised to give you. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no league, no uh, agreement. You shall not join yourself with the inhabitants of this land. You shall throw down their altars. But you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Why did you decide to do it this way? Wherefore I also said, I will not drive them up before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare unto you. And it came to pass when the angel of the Lord spake these words unto all the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voice and they wept. So they still have some sense in their heads. They still respect God and this angel enough to, to feel conviction and to feel sorry. And they, and they lifted up their voice. They worshipped in that day. In verse 7, you skip down a few verses. The people served the Lord all the days of Joshua. See, they, never, they still never drove them out. They're still living there. The people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. But there came a day when Joshua died. Verse 8 tells us about it. The servant of the Lord Joshua, he died being 110 years old. Verse 9 says they buried him in verse 10. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. But then there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel, this next generation, they did evil in the sight of the Lord and they served Balaam. The images that God told His people to tear down and to destroy and get out of the land, they left them there. And then the next generation began to worship them. The first generation, they still served God. They, they just kind of tolerated these idols. They tolerated their enemies, but... The old saying goes like this, what one generation tolerates, the next generation will embrace. And that's exactly what happened. Their children, they began to worship Balaam instead of God. Verse 12 says, they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt, and they followed other gods. 
of the gods of the people that were around about them, and they bowed themselves not to the Lord God Almighty, but unto these graven images, and they provoked the true God to anger. And they forsook the Lord, and they served Baal and Ashtaroth. Israel made a decision. Somebody say a decision. They made a decision to not completely drive out the Canaanites. They made a decision to leave the idols dedicated to Balaam and Ashtaroth. They left those graven images in their towns, in their communities, in their villages. That was their decision. But what they didn't know is that they were making some other decisions at the very same time. They were making the decision that their children would not serve God. They were making the decision that their children would bow down to idols instead of bowing their knee in prayer. They made the decision that future generations would be in bondage to enemy nations. It was decisions they had no idea they were making, but nonetheless, they made them. They made them. And we've talked a few minutes here tonight how this principle works in a negative context. But you know what? This principle also works for the good. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, he shall also reap. If you reap to the flesh, you shall of the flesh reap corruption. You make bad decisions, there's other bad decisions that are being made at the same time. But if you reap to the Spirit, if you sow to the Spirit, you shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. If you make good decisions, then there's good decisions being made in the background at the same time. Now, I'm not going to be long tonight. I'm just going to actually ask Alana if she'll come back and just play. Almost done. This principle works for the good. In Genesis, we read of a man named Joseph. He's familiar. You know Joseph. When Joseph was young, God gave him dreams and visions of his future. Joseph saw that someday his whole family would bow down to him, and his jealous half-brothers didn't like that very much. And they decided to throw Joseph in a pit and eventually sell him into slavery. And Joseph ended up working for a man named Potiphar. And the Bible says that Potiphar's house prospered because of, the Lord, of Joseph's efforts. And because of this, Potiphar made Joseph overseer of his house. I mean, he was high up. Almost the top dog next to Potiphar, probably. Overseer of his house. You see, Potiphar, something was kind of happening in, in the shadows. Potiphar wasn't the only one who noticed Joseph. Potiphar's wife also had her eye on him and would often come to Joseph and tempt him and ask him to sleep with her, trying to commit an affair. Now, one day while working... Potiphar's wife approached Joseph and was quite forceful with her request this day. And in this moment, Joseph had a decision to make. He had a decision to make. Go in and, and sleep with this woman, this adulterous, immoral woman, or flee. Now Joseph, you know the story probably, he made the right decision. And he fled from her that day. That was the decision that he made, but what Joseph maybe didn't realize in the moment is that at the very same time, he was making other decisions as well. By deciding to honor God and not sleep with this woman, Joseph, first of all, he was making the decision to be sent to an Egyptian prison. Now this is another sermon for another time, but sometimes, even in the midst of doing right, it seems like we're getting the short end of the stick. Now, we know the end of the story. Hindsight is twenty twenty. We can look at Joseph's life and we can see that God was at work the whole way. But sometimes, I mean, it feels like, God, I made the right decision. I, I didn't do that. I did do this. And, and God, here I am still in turmoil. I'm still in the midst of my circumstance. I'm, I'm in a prison cell. Again, another sermon for another time. But, but that was a decision that was made because of the initial decision, decision Joseph made. Joseph also decided at that same moment to be made second in command over all of Egypt. Probably wouldn't have happened if he slept with her. In fact, he probably would have got killed. But when he decided to run from Potiphar's wife, he was also making the decision to be made second in command over all of Egypt next to Pharaoh himself. But even more powerful and greater than that, he decided to preserve the lives of countless people, including his own family. You see, we read about Israel. They made some decisions that impacted their family for the bad. But Joseph made a decision that impacted his family and preserved his family. It was for the good. Now you think that 
that decisions that you make, decisions to, I, I don't know, you guys can fill in the blank, but decisions to cheat, decisions to lie, decisions to sin in some way, you think that it just impacts you. You think that it's an isolated incident, it's a decision you're making in a vacuum, but what you don't realize is that you're making decisions at the same time that you have no idea you're making. Decisions that will impact your future, decisions that will impact your family, your future family, your current family, the Lord tarries, if you guys have kids, decisions that you didn't know you were making. Maybe you're making a decision now that children that you're going to have in the future won't serve God. Maybe you're making decisions that they will serve God. Decisions you don't know you're making. Joseph thought he was just saying no to sin. But what he didn't realize is that he was saying yes to so much more. For every decision made, there is a corresponding, a corollary decision being made in the background. Now, in Scripture, how many know that people, they sometimes look at Christianity and they think it's just, the Bible is just a rule book. Anybody ever heard something like that? The Bible is just a rule book. It's just a big bunch of rules, things you can't do. And you know what? It is true. God does ask us at times to say no to things. He does. He asks us to make some decisions and, and say, you know what? Don't go there. Don't do that. Jesus still said, if you want to follow me, deny yourself. Say no. Decide. Make a decision. Say no. Deny yourself. Take up your cross daily if you want to follow me. So sometimes we do have to say no to things in life. We have to say no to certain pleasures, sure. We have to say no to certain activities, say no to certain relationships, say no to this, say no to that. But what you don't realize is that by saying no to something, at the same time you're saying yes to something so much greater. When we say no to the things of the world, we're saying yes to all that God has for us. You're saying yes to God's blessing. You're saying yes to God's favor. You're saying yes to God's direction. And ultimately, you're saying yes to God's heaven. When you say no, you're making decisions that maybe you don't even realize you're making. And I said it earlier, you know, in the negative context, every decision you make, it's not made in a vacuum. If you do something really stupid and crazy, sinful, whatever, it's not made in a vacuum. It does impact your life, right? But what the enemy would love to get you to believe is that every decision you make for the good, for God, that those decisions are made in a vacuum. And that is also equally untrue. The enemy would love for you to believe that by you deciding to lay aside some, I don't know, some frills in life, making some sacrifices, giving into God's kingdom, taking some time, some days, and fasting and seeking God's face. He would love to, to get you to believe that those decisions to say no to some pleasures of life for the good of your spiritual man, that those decisions are made in a vacuum and they are not. And what I'm trying to say is this, if God is calling you, it might not be a sin, it might not be anything overtly evil, but if God is calling you to just lay aside something that is a weight, you know, the scripture says, uh, lay aside every weight and the sin. There is a difference. You can have some things in your life that are just weighing you down, keeping you from God's purpose. And if God is calling you to lay aside one of these weights, maybe God is calling you to fast, to lay aside some meals, to lay aside some, some media consumption, to lay aside some relationship that you know is just dragging you down. If God is calling you to do that, let me just promise you something. No decision you ever make is ever made in a vacuum. And there are correlating, underlying, under-the-surface decisions that you're making at the very same time. And when you say uh, yes to a fast, you say no to some food perhaps, you are saying yes to God speaking to you and to God leading you and prompting you in the Holy Ghost. Because no decision for the positive is ever made in a vacuum either. Making sense tonight? God's calling you to lay aside media. Don't watch that anymore. Even if it's just, I don't know, like Barney and Friends or something like this, but you're watching it like all the time. Did I just lose you? You'd be watching SpongeBob SquarePants, but if you're watching 30 episodes a day, and God's saying, look, you need to just, 
I like SpongeBob too, but you know what? You just need to lay that, lay that aside. The enemy would love for you to believe, you know what? That's not going to do anything good. It's an isolated decision that really won't impact your life. You might as well just keep on doing it, keep on watching it, keep on eating it, keep on, keep on. But there are underlying decisions that you are making for the good of your spiritual man, for the good of God's kingdom, for the good of your city that you will never see, maybe not even till heaven. But perhaps a fast that you go on this very week is the fast that unlocks a door to some soul that God wants you to win. And maybe heaven is the only time that will tell. Maybe you won't know until we get there. But you know what? It was a decision you didn't know you were making. A decision that they would be in heaven that you made when you said, God, I'm just going to give up this, my supper today. I'm going to pray and seek your face. Decisions you didn't know you were making. Could you stand together with me? No decision you ever make is incidental, insignificant, or trivial for the good or for the bad. So you know what? If you got, if you've been making some bad decisions, it's time to stop making those decisions. It's time to turn that around because it's not incidental. I'm telling you. And some of you already know that. You, you know this firsthand. But it goes the same for good and for God. No decision, no investment that you ever make in the kingdom is incidental. There's decisions that you don't know you were making. And I, I just felt, I just felt so strongly that maybe God is calling you to just, I don't even know what it is, but you know right now. You know, you already know. If God is calling you to do it, make solid, make firm, make sure your decision. Say, God, I am. I'm giving it up. God, I'm laying it aside. God, I'm going to spend some extra time in your word. God, you've been calling me. I'm going to make that decision tonight. I'm going to follow through. I'm going to do it. And you know what? That's not the only decision you're making. And only eternity will tell what other decisions they were. Can we just pray together? And you know what? Just ask the Lord to lead you. I really feel like maybe God is calling some people to lay some things aside, to get things right. Decisions that you don't know you're making. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we're thankful for your word. God, we're thankful that you're able to just cut through all the, all the junk, all the peripheral stuff in our lives, and you're able to get right down to the, to the heart of the matter, God. And I feel like you've done that tonight. Jesus, I ask that for somebody that you would speak to them and you'd show them your will and show them your way, God, whatever you're calling them to or whatever you're calling them from, whatever decision needs to be made, God. I pray that the, the spirit of Joshua would come over me and just to this youth group allow me to say, choose you this day. Choose you this day. Make a decision. And God help us to realize that no decision is ever made in a vacuum. No decision we make for good or bad is ever incidental or inconsequential. God, we can impact the kingdom and we can impact souls for all eternity by just a few simple decisions. And God help us to make them tonight. God, help us to make them concrete tonight. Help us to not leave this place until we've consecrated some things to you. In the name of Jesus, God, if you've called somebody to a fast, I pray, Jesus, that it would just be a clarion call that just rings through and, and cuts through everything else in their life. God, help them to feel it and hear it like never before tonight. God, if you're calling somebody to seek you harder than they ever have before, I pray in Jesus' name that that call would just go forth one more time tonight and we would make that decision firm in our lives. Jesus, for somebody that you're reaching for tonight that's been making bad decisions, God, we know that your grace is sufficient to cover every bit of our past. And God, we can decide to do the complete opposite tonight. We can decide one more time to give our lives back to you. And I pray you give somebody the courage to do it tonight in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. Somebody just pray in the Spirit tonight. Pray in the Spirit. Allow the Lord to lead you. His Spirit is here in a powerful way right now. God, we covet your leading. God, we covet your direction right now. Lead us in your way. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. We, we're finished well ahead of time. It's only 7.48. we got about 12 minutes. I wonder if we could end it all around the front all together. You guys in? I wonder if we could all just make our way to the front. We're going to pray together. And I'm telling you,
great revival, a decision to have great revival is not made by saying, I want to have a great revival or, or I'm deciding to have great revival. You know how you make that decision? You make that decision by making a decision to seek God's face. You make that decision by, by reaching out into a hurting and a lost world and, and witnessing and sharing the love and the light of Jesus. You make that decision and you'll make another decision to have a great in, in gathering of souls and a great revival in this day. You understand? It's a decision that, I mean, you can go in with your eyes somewhat open. You can know that you're making decisions toward that underlying decision I'm telling you bigger decisions are being made at the same time it's just coming really close guys we're going to pray together we're just going to seek God for a few moments here come on in in the name of Jesus if you feel to pray one for another that's fine you don't have to if you feel to kneel and just consecrate something to God I'm, I'm urging you tonight if you have felt it all led by God to lay something aside if you have felt it all led by God to just put away some leisure of life that's just been consuming your time. You know what? Tonight's the night. Tonight is the night. Lord Jesus, we, we need you, Lord. We need you, Jesus. Spirit tonight. Let the Spirit pray through you. If you don't know what else to say, the Bible says that the Spirit can pray through us with, with groanings that cannot even be uttered. You don't even know what you're saying. But allow God to pray through you tonight. If you've been given the gift of the Holy Ghost, exercise that tonight and, and pray in tongues. Pray in the Spirit. You don't know deciding to go on that fast. Maybe you're deciding that the friend you sit beside at school is going to be in church this fall. You deciding to say no to some sin and being engaged in God's presence every day making those decisions. Maybe that's the decision that makes another decision that a great revival will come through our high schools and our middle schools. Decisions that you have no idea you're making, but let God lead you. Make the decisions He's calling you to. Jesus. Yeah, of belaboring the point let me just say one more time no decision you ever make is made in a vacuum none let's go make some good decisions for the kingdom of God and let's let heaven tell the, tell the tale who knows who might be one who knows who might be impacted who knows who knows who knows decisions you didn't know you were making in Jesus name name. Ashton, if you could bring the uh, the offering plates. If you have something to give in the offering, I would encourage you before you leave, uh, you can just put it here in the plate. And uh, if you're visiting, we're not after your money. We're glad you're here. 
but this is just another form of worship. So feel free to give. Who knows? Deciding to put a toonie in the plate. <laughs> Who knows what decision you might be making? Thank you guys for being here. Next Wednesday night, Kendra Shock is with us. Be here. Invite a friend. She'll be speaking. It's going to be a great, great service. If you still haven't paid for Boston, get that money into me. I need it. God bless you. We'll see you this weekend.